So I believe that everybody is walking through this world with a whiteboard on their chest, okay? And on this whiteboard, they're literally walking up to each person they meet and handing them a marker saying, will you write on my whiteboard what I'm worried? And it's interesting because if people are going into conversations, they want to tell you their story so you can tell them their worth. So what do people most typically talk about? They talk about their past successes, they talk about their wins, they talk about you know their proudest moments in life because it's like social media, they only want you to see the good stuff. So if they can tell you the right story, they can get the right feedback from you, AKA right on their whiteboard, and find out so much more and feel good about themselves because you help them figure out what their worth is. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, before we get into today's guest, it's interesting. I just finished interviewing our guest, Donnie Bovine. Now, Donnie has an interesting history of you know, going through st- several different jobs and then had an epiphany. I'd rather you listen to his story than me tell it f- for you sort of a second time here. Before he found sort of his zone, his purpose, his assignment, and what he calls vision. So I'll let him explain that. My encouragement for everybody listening to these podcasts, and thank you very much for sharing your most valuable commodity, your time, is that every single person listening has an assignment, a call, a purpose. Uh, You have a place where you can make a difference in other people's lives. But the reality is, is that we have to do the work to get clear about what that is. I've just had the pleasure of doing an event in Denver with one of our associates, Randy Brothers. And Randy had all these individuals in the room, there was over 70 of them, who had not been really exposed to personality or personal style before or values. And at the end of the session, I was just humbled by the appreciation that people had to say, this makes so much sense you know, the personal style indicator, and that is why it's the number one rated tool in the marketplace by participants, is that it's so transformational. It gives you an understanding of who you are and the understanding of others and how can I build relationships and be intentional in life. So if you already haven't done so, or you have people that you care about, our encouragement is is that other that or the values, those would be a couple of tools that you could share with others, help them to go to the next level. Uh, and for your own uh, growth and development if you haven't taken it yourself. Uh, When we think about our show today, as always, thank you for sharing, passing it on, leaving a positive review with whatever platform you're listening on. The other one is is just leave some comments, is that we don't know everybody who's listening. I got a a LinkedIn communication the other day from somebody who says, Ken, you don't know me, but I've been listening to your interviews. I love them. Uh, I've listened to many of them over the time. We have no idea. And so any kind of communication is appreciated. If you have somebody that you can recommend uh, to be a guest for us, that's also appreciated. That fits into our profile. So thank you again for listening. And here's our guest today, Donnie Bovine. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, I have the pleasure of having somebody who is a fellow podcast host, but also works with helping people with their success mindset, their success strategies. He actually has a podcast, I believe, called The Success Champion or Success Champions. Is that not correct, Donnie? Yeah, it is. Success Champions. So welcome to the show, Donnie Bovine. Oh, no, you actually yeah, got it right. I was just not going to say that last name incorrectly. I mean, I'd be paying the price. <laughs> well, you know, if you would have said bovine, I would have said, you know, Kais, and we would have just been off to the races. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, there we go. And uh, being an ex-dairy farmer, I was just feeling more comfortable with that pronunciation. <laughs> well, but, I live uh, on a farm now. I don't have cows, but I do have a lot of goats, so that helps. Well, goats. Uh, you don't want to know what I we think about goat people. Oh. So, though, you, though your status is upgraded with the fact that goats are now used in yoga classes. <laughs> is that what you're doing? No, no, but I've, I've had several people request that I do goat yoga. Um, 
even though we're fixing to have a bunch of kids on the farm. Yeah, no, no, I have no desire to watch people crawl around like goats poop on them. Well, um, there you go. Well, <laughs> well, Donnie, here at uh, Secrets of Success, we always like to get to know our guests and some of their background before we get into sort of your expertise now in helping other business owners and individuals succeed in life. I know that you have a military background and you were in the Marine Corps, but let's go back before that. Just sort of what part of the country did you grow up and what was sort of your family of heritage? Oh, yeah, great question. I don't get to talk about it that often, so thanks for that. Um, you know, I was born in Florida, but dad was a truck driver, mom was a factory worker, and so we kind of chased dad around the country. Not bad. I think I lived in about six different states up until uh, age five or six. But, you know, you know, we went where the work was, and so grew up in a very, very uh, awesome blue-collar family home, and, you know, we've always been the family everybody else wanted to hang out with. So mom and dad are almost 50 years together at this point. And, you know, literally growing up, our house was the house you hung out at. And, you know, mom and dad were just good people down to earth. And, you know, uh, looking at them too, they were the people that nobody was going to bet on them making it anywhere. And there's a country song called Two Sparrows in a Hurricane. It pretty much speaks of their entire life. And, you know, they brought up three boys. And we all well, kind of walked. that's trouble already, right, Donnie? I have yeah, two you're absolutely right. Two brothers, but we added a sister at the tail end of the caboose. Oh, so well, if you ask my brothers, brothers, I was supposed to be the sister. So, I mean, there's that. <laughs> I, uh, I thought of something, but I can't say it on air. But anyway, <laughs> being said, I know you have a sense of humor already. And you don't want to have humor on this show. We want to be, you know, just very straight and right, you know, right, you know, right. For people that are listening. Now, what do you think? I mean, I'm I'm curious by it because it's interesting. That was actually one of the family threads that we had at our place when our two kids were growing up is that we wanted to be the house of choice for all their friends to come over. How did your family do that? In other words, what was sort of the philosophy behind we want these kids are hanging out at your place? What was it about your place that made it such a comfortable, attractive place to go to? Well, I mean, it was a number of things. One, mom and dad, you know, of course, had us when they were younger. I think, you know, mom was 17 when she got pregnant with my little brother. Um, and dad's just a few years older than her. So they had us all pretty young. I mean, I was born when mom was 24. And the only reason I know exactly is because I was born on my mom's birthday. So best birthday present she ever got. Mm. And of course, Donnie, of course. <laughs> um, but you know, mom and dad growing up like they did, they always wanted that. You know, they knew how they grew up. I mean, dad grew up in a, in a poor family and was rough and in trouble and stuff in high school. So they knew that we were going to do things that we were probably going to drink. We were probably going to smoke. We were going to probably do all the things that could lead us down into a very horrible paths. And their kind of rule and choice became the norms, of course, cleared with all the other families, that if you were going to drink, drink at our house. If you were going to smoke, smoke at the house. And uh, that became kind of the norm. So we had the cool family where, I mean, all the parents knew, but they wouldn't throw major parties, but we would all sit down, hang out with mom and dad. And, you know, it wasn't until we were in high school, late in high school, before we started drinking and things, but, but we did it there. And, you know, you had rules. You came in the house. If you were going to, you know, drink or do whatever, you handed mom your keys and that was it. You know, you never got them back until the next day. And it was that kind of lifestyle. If you're going to do it, do it with us. Um, that really formed that bond with, I mean, I, I really feel like I could tell mom and dad everything, you know, so there was no secrets going through high school. And I think a lot of times my friends were not jealous, but in awe of what we had as a family, because I mean, I was the only kid I knew growing up that the parents weren't divorced. You know, all my friends, you know, had gone through and some of wow. them several divorces. And so I think that we were a complete family unit, if you will, that that really 
made us a safe place, you know, to be. And, and that really made it just a cool place to hang out, which, you know, mom and dad, of course, loved. And, you know, even into our adulthood, it's still mom and dad's places where everybody hangs out. Mm-hmm. And, and I just love that, Donnie, that they created that environment for you. Now, was your dad a long haul trucker or local? Uh, he, well, he did a little bit of long haul, but he was mainly, you know, not hot shots. It was still the 18 wheelers, you know, so, but it was a couple of days over the road, not, not the weeks at a time. Right. So, and I remember, you know, even as a kid, you know, he snuck me into his truck one day and we went from uh, Kansas to Colorado run and I, of course, wasn't supposed to be in the truck, but that was one of my coolest memories as a kid is dad literally sneaking me in his truck and me going on the road with him for a couple of days. Now, if he'd gotten a car, of course, he'd gotten a lot of trouble. Um, but as a kid, you know, your dad's your superhero. So the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, my two brothers weren't there and I get to go ride with them was a really, really, really cool experience and memory, even though we almost got busted once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you're squirrely and you can hide quick. So exactly with that, right. So with that, Donnie, uh, where did you end up going after high school? So literally it was just a few months after graduating high school. I was in Marine Corps boot camp. You know, I uh, enlisted uh, my senior year. Yeah, it was my senior year I enlisted and then went in right after that and got stationed in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, the armpit of the U.S. And uh, it was kind of unique. <clears throat> my brother, who did my oldest brother, did 24 years in the Marine Corps. And at the time when I got stationed in North Carolina, he was actually stationed in South Carolina. So I was, you know, for a lot of times, even though I was away from mom and dad and, and the family, my brother and his wife were just five hours south of me, so most times on long weekends and everything, I was able to go hang out with them down at their place. And we've got a lot of memories, probably some we should not share on your show, but we have a lot of fun. Sure. Yeah. Well, you we know, can do that uh, privately later, Donnie. Exactly right, exactly right. We also don't want to have you incarcerated before the end of the show, right? <laughs> now, now, Donnie, what was driving you to enlist? Since there wasn't really that history with your mom and dad, what was it that was motivating well, that you? Well, dad did serve in the Navy. Um, you know, so there was that. But but two things for me, and, I, you know, I'd love to sit here and tell you that I joined the Marine Corps because I was a patriot, wanted to serve my company, country and all that, but that'd be an absolute lie. The, the reason I went into the Marine Corps, first and foremost, is because my oldest brother had. And growing up, I really looked up to him. Well, it's funny for me to say it. I look down to him because he's always been shorter than I am, but um, I've always Fair looked enough. up to him. And, and so he went that direction. And two, I was a kid in high school with no direction. You know, I, I, I didn't know what the heck I wanted to be when I grew up. I hated school. And, you know, literally teachers had passed me on and told me they passed me on. So there was no chance that they would get me back the next year. And so... I was in a spot where I was getting close to graduating, not knowing what I was going to do. And I literally just kind of on a whim walked up to the Marine Corps recruiter and said, okay, let's go. And you know, that's, that's why I enlisted. And it was really because that was the only option in front of me. I mean, I'd worked at a couple of fast food places. I'd worked at a catfish restaurant. I did a little bit of HVAC, but I had nothing ahead of me. I knew I wasn't going to do college. And there was just nothing ahead of me, so the Marine Corps just became, like, the next thing to do. And then I did that for the next four years and got out of that in 1999. And so you left after four years. Now, was that, I can't wait to get out, or it's just... Oh, yeah, no, I, I, was, I ran. <laughs> you know, I love telling everybody, I, I love the Marine Corps. I think it taught me a lot of great lessons. Uh, probably the greatest one is the solidified that I don't like authority. I don't like being told what to do. Um, really? That's, but, that shocks me, Don. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but I respect what they did. I respect what I learned. And I'm so thrilled that I went through the experience and I tell everybody you couldn't pay me enough to go back. But you know, literally when, when I got the opportunity to leave, I, I left very, very quickly and got out with an honorable discharge, which was, you know, awesome, which means I somehow got through four years doing everything I was supposed to do. And, you know, 
when I got out, it was kind of like when I went in. You know, I had no direction once again. You know, I didn't still, know what I was. Still, that was not really, you were clear about what you didn't want to do in terms yeah. of authority. Which is sometimes very helpful in figuring out what you do want to do. Right. And, you know, so, yeah, so I was lost and, you know, my best friend from high school, him and his dad were doing HVAC work, heating and air conditioning. And so I went to work for them doing heating and air conditioning because basically I didn't have anything else lined up. You know, I didn't know what the heck I was supposed to do. I mean, uh, the only thing I had in my belt was I was a Marine and, you know, everybody take this with a grain of salt when I say this, but being a veteran means nothing in corporate America. You know, it, it, it does not compute or translate to any tangible skill set. So um, my choice was I could go back to working in a fast food place or I do what I did. And luckily, I got a job working with my best friend and his dad. Okay. So how long were you hanging out with them? So I did that from 99 to 2001. So just um, a couple of years. Yeah, um, and I went from being the guy who crawled underneath houses to the guy who led their sales team, and uh, through somehow stumbling through not knowing what I was doing, grew them from a less than five hundred thousand dollar company to a three million dollar organization. Because well, and just in just a couple of years. Yeah, I was I was trying to quit because I realized that I hated what I was doing. I was doing heating and air conditioning in Texas you know, 110 degrees outside and 140 degree attics and was just miserable. And as I tried to quit, uh, Jerry, who owned the company, you know, looked at me and said, before you quit, you should try sales. And I said, you know, really, I don't even know what that means. And he said, well, you're going to start off going door to door and see if people <laughs> wanted to uh, get their units upgraded or have us come in and just do a once over and see if everything was okay. And so I said, as long as I'm not having to crawl in attics, I'm in. And so I started doing that. And that's what really started me down the path of my sales career. Mm. So and, you know, again, you knew what you didn't want to do. Yep. And I get it 140 degree attics. Yep. Or as we say up here in Canada, you know, 45 Celsius, that uh, was something that sort of was defining as well. So now right. you're there selling for them, but you leave them. So where did you go then? So, so I was actually recruited by a company out of St. Louis. And I, we happened to do an install on a local pharmacy. And we installed, I sold the units and we installed the units. And I got talking to the district manager over the area. And cause I didn't know at the time that when we did it, they were a franchise. And so I got to meet the district manager and the district manager asked how a company like ours won this deal when they typically work with national companies. And, you know, so I just kind of walked him through our process of how I won the business and everything else. And I, and I, I built the entire process and I really didn't know what I was doing, but, and, uh, he was pretty impressed, I guess, with what I had done. And he said, you know, I know our company is hiring in our franchising department. Would you ever consider moving, you know, out of Texas? And I laughed and I said, uh, will you buy the plane ticket? He goes, probably so. And literally a couple of days later, I got it. He called me and said, hey, would you seriously fly up for an interview? And I said, sure. You know, I had nothing here other than family, which I love, but, you know, I was still figuring life out, trying to find my next adventure. So I flew up there, and I remember I had owned one suit, and I was going up for three days worth of interviews. <laughs> I had one suit. So I flew up there and, you know, literally bought a couple of shirts at Walmart while I was there so I could at least wear a different shirt, you know, because all my stuff was blue-collar, you know, T-shirt and stuff. That's, right. you know, basically what I – in polos. But – and, you know – First time I ever did a panel interview, you know, I won that whole thing and they hired me on to start on the bottom tier of their franchise sales team. And which means I was doing a lot of data analytics and stuff, um, but then moved up to handle all their store openings and new franchise sales. And uh, it was fun. We worked for their total of three years and we grew that company from 80 million to 100 million in that, in that time before we were bought out by uh, Cardinal Health. And, you know, at that point, 
I always tell everybody that, you know, I did not understand corporate politics. I still don't understand corporate politics, but I really didn't understand it. And uh, long short of it is I was corporate downsized, which means my butt really got fired only because it was redundancy. They had an entire sales team and unit and everything in uh, Ohio where their corporate office was, and they considered our sales team in St. Louis as redundant, so they let the whole team go. Um, it's corporate downsize, as they called it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, or right size or whatever. Right size, whatever. We were fired. I mean, mm-hmm. nowhere does this say you were fired by Cardinal Health anywhere, right? But, you know, I went from working there to no longer working there. And uh, so, you know, I was in St. Louis, you know, I basically had a company condo, company car, you know, everything. So they were taking it all and they was given a very short window to figure out what I was going to do. And I didn't really have anything. You know, they had all my furniture. I had clothes and I had my truck. So uh, I took their money that they had and came back home to Texas. And, you know, I really thought that that was going to be like the start of my corporate America. I was going to come home, you know, the triumphant kid who climbed the corporate ladder and, and everybody's going to be impressed by that. And I was going to go, you know, take on the world. And yeah, I came back and couldn't find a job anywhere. You know, I was applying all over the place. And a lot of times because I left that, that job in St. Louis with the title of director and here, I think I was 24 years old, I think, maybe 23. And, you know, people were looking at me and telling me I was either underqualified to be a director title or I was overqualified to try and find something even more entry level. And I was trying to lie on my resume and downsize everything, and I just couldn't find a job anywhere. So all my friends from high school and everything were bartending and waiting tables. So I went bartending and waiting tables because I was quickly running out of money without a job Mm -hmm. and uh, did that for two years. And it was fun. Learned a lot. I learned tremendous amount of sales in that time. But I also partook in the lifestyle that came along with it. So there was a lot of heavy drug use. There was a lot of alcohol and, you know, uh, two years into it, I was finally getting to that point that, man, I can't, this can't be my life. You know, so once again, I found myself in a spot that I knew exactly what I didn't want to do and it was continue this lifestyle. So I had met my then fiance, now wife, uh, during that, the bartending years and, so I was looking to start settling down. So I removed all my nighttime bartending shifts and became a day bartender. And in doing that, I felt like I could get in front of the corporate people Mm -hmm. that can make decisions and help me find a job. And it worked. There was a a phenomenal lady uh, by the name of Jane Miranda that I owe a lot to. Uh, she was one of my regulars, her and a gal named Bev used to come into the Bennigan's I worked at and was bartending and, and they never drank. Um, you know, I don't think Jane really drank all hardly at all, but they'd always come in and have like a diet Coke and a water and split a sandwich. And they've got to hear my story over the years. Well, she had gone off to Pennsylvania to a huge print, uh, trade show. And the guy up on stage, who was their keynote, said, you know, his greatest salesperson that he'd ever found in his life happened to be his server at a, at a local restaurant. And Jane said as soon as she heard that, she knew she was gunning for me. So she came back, and that Monday, she asked if I was still looking for a job. And I said, absolutely. And you know, I pulled my resume out from underneath the bar top, because that's where I kept it, trying to wait for somebody to hopefully ask for it. <clears throat> and uh, she brought me in to do an interview, and she had a new entire division that she was looking to start and none of the current sales team wanted to take it on. So she brought me into a $40 million company to start an entire new division, a new sales division in digital printing before it became a thing. And I was to head up and start the entire division, not knowing anything about printing, not really knowing anything about this type of sales and, and go. So that, that, I tell everybody that was really my first big, big boy sales job was building out that division. 
because I it was I really had to learn sales the hard way, and you know, luckily, you know, we grew that division to six point one million dollars from scratch, and you know, we we really had a lot of fun building it out, and and for me, I really cut my teeth in learning how to do professional and high end commercial sales. And it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, you know, during that time. And then we all hit the downturn of 08 and 09 and those fun years. And, you know, but, uh, it was, it was, it was a, it was a cool time where I was, somebody saw something more than I saw in myself mm-hmm. and, and gave me a chance to, to, to run with it. It was fun. It was fun. Well, you've, you probably figured out by now, so we'll get that here in a moment. But if you go back, you must have been doing something right in these different roles to be able to grow the companies. You know, if it's the franchise, if it's the printing, you know, if it's being successful as a server. So when we think about the listeners and serving them, what were some of the things, maybe even unbeknownst or unknown to yourself, but what were some of the things you were doing that was causing even that early success that you were maybe not even aware of what you were doing well? What was yeah, that's a great question. I love that. You know, I think the biggest thing, and I've told people this in the past, is I was naturally curious. And so when I would go and talk to even bartending or sales, whatever, I would go in because I, I, I wanted to understand people. And I wanted to understand their 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 story, where they came from. And you know, I never took anything at face value. So, so whether it was going on sales calls and somebody saying they already had a vendor or anything, I never saw it as like overcoming objections or anything. I wanted to understand why they already had a vendor and would never look anywhere else. And not, not trying to convince them that I was the way to go, I wanted to understand their entire process, but in doing that, I found oftentimes nobody had ever questioned why that that was the way they already always done things. So it always got me into some really cool conversations. And when I focus more on the individual versus the sale, things really cool things happened. I mean, Mary Kay Corporate was my largest account when I sold commercial printing. It was a two million dollar account for me, and. I got that that deal because I befriended the guy who ran their in-house print shop and a guy named Keith and, and we became really good friends and I wasn't even doing any business with him. And, you know, I got to know about his family and, and everything because I was genuinely interested in him as a person. He had a fascinating story about how he climbed through the ranks to get where he was because he had started as a warehouse guy. And he'd worked up to running the entire and and it was that genuine interest in people that helped me find all the success that I've found. And, you know, I've carried that interest into my podcast, my business and everything that I do now. And it's because I want to know the person, you know, for me, sales is not a transaction. It's a relationship. And it's getting to know somebody so so you can go have real conversations. And, you know, I grew up in an era of sales where it was, you know, get the deal done at all costs. And I just hated all that stuff. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do it. I mean, if, if I can't go have a conversation with somebody and we both walk away feeling good about that conversation, then why am I having it? And so I think that genuine curiosity, curiosity, the desire to get to know somebody, I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole lot different conversation when you can walk up and say, you know, hey, Ken, how's the family? How's the side gig going? How's, you know, and, and before you ever say, hey, you know, I know we've been working on that deal, you go and you do a genuine, real conversation and you get to know somebody. And now, I think that's, I, it's sorry to interrupt you for a moment, yeah. Donnie, but it's interesting. My wife and I play a game when we go to parties or gatherings or events. And we've been able to go to events for two, three hours, multiple individuals, dozens and dozens of people. We're not a single person asks a question about us. Isn't that crazy? It's a bit of a game we play. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I said, can I keep asking Donnie questions so that he never asks or flips it on, well, what do you do, Ken? And right. it is amazing how few people, and I mean, it's one of the spaces that we're in as a company, how yeah. few people have like almost zero emotional intelligence, uh, interpersonal skills, communication skills. You know, I don't know. It is like zero, like it's just like entry level conversation. Yeah, and I don't think it's emotional intelligence. I, I honestly think they just don't know any better. Um, I think we grow up in a very self-centered world. And we're traditionally brought up in a world where everybody says, you know, well, tell me about you. And we're used to regurgitating, you know, and keeping that spotlight on us. And see, I have this cool theory, and you'll probably like this. So I believe that everybody is walking through this world with a whiteboard on their chest, okay? And on this whiteboard, they're literally walking up to each person they meet and handing them a marker saying, will you write on my whiteboard what I'm worth? And it's interesting because just like what you said with you and your wife, as people are going into conversations, they want to tell you their story so you can tell them their worth. So what do people most typically talk about? They talk about their past successes. They talk about their wins. They talk about, you know, their proudest moments in life because it's like social media. They only want you to see the good stuff, right? So, so if they can tell you the right story, they can get the right feedback from you, a.k.a. right on their whiteboard, and, and find out so much more and feel good about themselves because you help them figure out what their worth is. So the fact that you and your wife are able to keep the spotlight on other people, it makes them feel really good about themselves. It's a very cool skill to have. The flip side of it is, is everybody's carrying around this whiteboard. And they're worried about what the other person thinks about them, right? They're, they're concerned about what you may think of them. Well, the funny thing is, everybody's carrying a whiteboard. So as soon as one person's thinking, man, what does that person think about me? That person's so entrenched in thinking about what you think about them that they're never even judging you. They're never, you know, writing on your whiteboard because they're so worried about how you're responding to their stories and their needs and everything else. And it starts this weird perpetual cycle of everybody trying to please everybody else versus everybody just being themselves and being genuinely interested people. I didn't say interesting, interested people. I mean, genuinely interested in somebody else's story. And, you know, it, it goes back to this is how we're taught to communicate. You walk by somebody, say, hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Right? It's, it's robotic movements in, and movements that people are naturally programmed to do through all our walks of life. And, you know, I just go back to it comes when you get naturally curious about somebody. You know, I don't mean to keep talking about my podcast, but on my podcast, what I ask everybody to do when we first start off is tell me your story. And it, I learned that just years ago from a sales call because, you know, I, I first got into, you know, corporate sales and I would go in and I'd break out all my brochures and my pamphlets and all my stuff. And I would just like verbally vomit all over these people trying to impress them, you know, of how awesome I was and that didn't work. So I went back to, okay, what worked? How did I keep people at the bar or how did I sell, help sell franchises? And it all came down to, dang, when I really am genuinely interested in people, the world opens up. And it's been a cool philosophy to carry with me, you know, through all of my endeavors. Well, you think about it, Donnie, is in, so we might uh, agree to disagree a little bit about the emotional intelligence, but what it is is just really people being even aware, and I agree with you there, even aware that they don't know that they don't know, and that this is something that is just not conscious. I've never heard the story about this whiteboard concept before, though maybe in a different, in a different framework or a different way about you know, where we're trying to impress other people. That I get and worrying what other people think and trying to drive our life that way. It's actually one of the characteristics I have in my new book, The Quest for Purpose, is you can't keep worrying about what other people think. 
Right. Uh, otherwise, your whole life will be what everybody else wants, not what you want. So here you are, Donnie, now, and thank you for that, is yeah. you're doing podcasts, you're helping entrepreneurs, you're being a consultant, you're a best-selling author. So let's get into how did you get to this space now, which is you know very similar to the work that we're doing. Yeah, so it, it's, it's been an, a very interesting ride, Ken. It, um, so when I left commercial printing, I was recruited into a sales training firm and had a lot of success there, moved my way up into a partner of the company and was getting ready to begin the discussions to buy him out. And so my partner, business partner and I had talked about, you know, a five year succession plan. I would take over the company and I really thought that that was my destiny. And up until the next part I'm fixing to tell you, I would have told everybody that I was going to be running this company for the rest of my life. That was going to be my retirement plan because it was fulfilling at the time when I thought every emotional need that I needed, every business need, it was, it was, I mean, up until that point, I mean, we bought our dream farm, our house. I built a second, you know, house on my farm for from my in-laws, and, you know, and we were living quote unquote the the life, and we were happy. I I, I wasn't miserable. I wasn't overworked. I, I you know, it was it was a fun fun life, and it just happened that one night out celebrating the year prior, I think it was the second time I tripled his business. And we were out having cocktails, and while we're out to dinner, he paused and looked at me and said, Donnie, i got to tell you, I'm so grateful that you're my retirement plan. And when he said that, I, I've tried to think on that moment for a lot, wrapping my head around it, but I really feel like that I immediately said, you're welcome, and probably something to the fact that, you know, I've really enjoyed working with you. And, but the truth is that I don't remember exactly how I responded. And when I got in my truck to drive home that night, I had a 45-minute drive home, I couldn't wrap my head around why that phrase was so chafing me. I mean, I was getting mad. And somewhere on the ride, it hit me. And I went in a lot more expletives than I'll use on your show. Um, I said, holy crap, I am somebody else's retirement plan. I am literally living somebody else's dream. And it was this weird emotional onslaught of, of feelings, emotions, and anger. And I mean, I started looking at my entire life and I was like, oh my God, I've never chosen my own path. I have literally always taken the thing in front of me and never picked my own path. i don't even know who I am at the moment. And I was really questioning everything. Interestingly enough, 15 days from that conversation, I walked away from it all. I walked away from the partnership. I walked away from that business. I walked away from the phenomenal amount of money I was making and launched my own business. And it came down to, I was 40 years old. And for 40 years old, I literally had never bet on me and chased my own dreams. And when that conversation happened, and truly, my business partner to this day, I love the guy. Great mentor, taught me a lot, and he meant that, that thank you for being a retirement plan, as a genuine compliment. He was truly grateful for all that I had done for him. Mm -hmm. For me, it was just a mental shift, and that was literally the catalyst that I decided to launch my business. Unfortunately, that was also the same day I told my wife I was doing all that. And uh, I remember looking at my wife and saying, babe, uh, I just quit. And she said, quit what? And uh, I walked her all the way through it. And, you know, we had a very candid conversation. We've always had a very open relationship, you know, as far as how we communicate. And, she looked at me and she goes, I'm scared to death, but this better work. I have faith in you, but this better work. And, you know, that's, that's how I started this whole adventure. And if you want, I can tell you how it went out the gate, uh, nothing like I expected it to. Well, of course, um, as an entrepreneur for over 30 years, 
<laughs> we always have our moments. Most people um, don't realize you work your butt off to kind of get where you are, and, and we have moments where we say, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Now, uh, Donnie, share with the audience, what is it that you are doing now? What is your expertise, and what is it, how are you serving, and who are you serving uh, in all those spaces right now? Yeah, so thank you for that. So I you know, set out to be a speaker when I launched my business, and I had no idea what that was going to take. So I spent the next year understanding what it took to get on stage and stuff. Along that process, I found podcasting. And I tell everybody podcasting saved my business, um, mainly because it taught me processes and, and, and the likes. So from finding podcasts, I found my business. I found a way to get on stages. And I ended up growing my business to multiple six figures, international, blah, blah, blah. And in doing that I discovered for me how to literally get out of my own way so I could get where I want to go. So what I do now is twofold. I primarily help small business owners get to where I am now. And that's what I tell everybody. I can't tell you I can build you a seven figure business. The reason being I haven't done it. So I don't know if I can get you there. But I can get you to a six. I can get you to multiple six. And so I'm teaching people the processes, the systems, the strategies of how they can actually level up and scale up their business. And we do it through a lot of PR and publicity and brand building. So I'm teaching things like how do they get on podcasts? How do they write their books? How do they get on stages? How do they actually monetize their talents and what they're good at? And, you know, so my clientele has come from a very wide variety. Um, a lot of them are service-based, but I'll have retail store owners and the like because the principles are all the same. And the principle for me is really, really simple. You should build your business to be an absentee owner. You should build your business so you are not the catalyst. I really want people to build their business so they could walk away from three months and their business would still grow, not sustain, but grow. And so we bring in a lot of automation. We bring in a lot of marketing. We teach them how to become the face and brand of their company by doing everything that I've done so far with my business. And I'm literally just teaching what I've done. And the results have been amazing. I mean, stories from like a gal named Stevie Dawn that, you know, came to me and her one goal was to have her husband be able to quit her job. Well, six months working together, she hit six figures. Her husband quit her job and is now number two in her company and they're thriving and she is running a phenomenal business. So it's, it's not coaching. I'm not a coach. It's consulting, and we do it a lot through masterminds and online courses and such. But it's just teaching people how they can put the process and systems in to become the brand of their company, you know, to be the face of the company, and build it so they can walk away and it still, still grows and thrives. Mm, excellent. Now, I'm going to skip back, <clears throat> Donnie, and by the way, agree with all that, and thanks for the work of helping really what drives the economic engine around the world, and that's entrepreneurs, regardless of what people say. <laughs> and that is, um, you know, because our work is around purpose. You had this job, you had this partnership, you were doing sales training, you seemed to enjoy that. You had this sort of epiphany about your being his retirement program. And I don't want to use the word why, but when you think about... Um, this realization that you've been living all these other people's sort of goals, how could you coach the audience to discern that? Say, am I living somebody else's goals or am I living mine or my dream or my purpose? So I I've taken question. over a company here that was founded by Dr. Terry Anderson, but it's very much mine and it's, it's who I am now after almost 20 years owning it. So, but I bought it from him and I, I willingly did, did so. So how do we help the listeners, Donnie, around that journey of clarity? Uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's a extremely intelligent question, Ken, and I, and I appreciate that. It, here's the thing. 
I and I loved it doing this because it drives people nuts. I don't believe in goal setting. I don't think goals work. I think they actually demotivate people. So so, but I I say that to say that I believe everybody should have a vision, and it's not Simon Sinek's why. I I, I it's not about having a why. A why is selfish. A why is for you. It's not for everybody else. So I think if an individual has a vision, and, and let me define vision. Uh, vision is what is that thing you're contributing to the world that's so big that other people want to join you on that journey and become champions of that vision. And I think you can relate it to it's it's what Steve Jobs did, it's what Jeff Bezos did, it, it, it's anybody who has done a, a master change to the world, it all started with a vision. And their vision was impactful enough that other people got it and wanted to be a part of it. I named my company Success Champions due to the fact I believe that everybody should be their own champion of their success. And I really believe that I can teach the world to become their own champion, to become that one person that's chosen to stand out front and represent everybody else. And that vision has been powerful enough that I've created other champions that have picked up that flame and run with it. So I would challenge anybody that is looking at their life and trying to figure out the move. It's what is that vision? What is that thing that I'm doing that's so big that other people get it, want to be a part of it, and I want to help you build to get there? And what I find is when I ask that question to most people, they don't have it. They stumble through it because they're hung up on what's my why. They're hung up on what goal am I supposed to accomplish. And it's none of those help. They just confuse the matter. It's what is your ultimate vision? What are you doing to give back to the world and society as a whole? And you figure that out and, and things will start clicking because other people will buy into that vision. And you can use something, well, we're recording this on Martin Luther King Day, which is a great day to do it. You know, Martin Luther King very simply said, I have a dream. And that became his massive vision. As soon as he said that speech, instantly his tribe of people showed up and said, I want to be part of that. And I think if most people will find that vision, if, and hear me, it's not a why. Find that vision of what they want to create, and other people will buy into that. Steve Jobs came out and said, you know, I want to build a, a computer for us. And as soon as he said that phrase, his people immediately said yes. And he moved like a third of the you know, entire world to buying Apple computers. And that's what I'm talking about, having a vision. A vision so strong that other people want to join in the game. Mm. It's interesting in some of the work that we do, I believe in active tense statements, which are visions, right, multiple visions, which means it's not something you ever achieve. You're always achieving, which is really this, what you framed out there. Yeah, I agree with that. It's not, it's, yes, there are some, some target goals underneath it, but the vision which is this active tense, you're always achieving, it's never fully achieved, it's just in play, uh, great insight on that. Now, Donnie, if you can believe it, we only have like four or five minutes left. Oh, okay. And so what I like to do is, first of all, let people know about how they can get a hold of you, and then I want to wrap up with some pieces of wisdom from you. Absolutely. So the easiest way to get a hold of me, guys, if you'll send a text to 817-318-6030, Send the word success. I'll send you over a work-life balance workbook. And the reason I did that is because early on running my company, I spent a lot of family time thinking about the business. So I teach people how – I don't believe there's full work-life balance, but I teach them how to leave work at work so they can spend more time with their family. So, so send give the me word that text number again. We'll put yep. it in the show notes, 817-318-6030. And just send the word success over, and we'll get that straight to you. Um, otherwise, if you want to find everything else, it's at DonnieBovine.com, and you can find out all about my summit and everything else we have coming up. Spell your name out, Donnie, because it's not. Yep. So it's D-O-N-N-I-E, B as in boy, O-I, V as in Victor, I-N. 
dot com, and that'll get you over to everything. Great, and then we'll we'll have the uh, text number in the show notes so that people can get that gift. So all that being said, and you know we've covered a lot already, if you can believe it, Donnie, is what would be some two or three things beyond what you've already shared to encourage individuals that might be an entrepreneur, might not be, to really own their own space in life beyond what you've shared so far? Yep. What would be maybe things to avoid or things to embrace? Uh, number one thing that you absolutely need to be doing in your life is breaking things. I also always, especially on stage, say, go get punched in the face by life. Rocky Balboa said it best. He said, life is not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can take a hit and keep moving forward. And I believe most people are coasting through life, staying in a state of what we call okayness. Everything's okay. And they stay there. Whether you're growing in life or growing in business, if things aren't breaking, you're not evolving. And in life, business, whatever else, we are all supposed to evolve into a greater version of ourselves. Because who you are right now is not who you need to become to get where you want to go. You literally have to evolve. I had to evolve to learn to be a business owner. So that's number one. Go get punched in the face. Go break things. Go try something new. Go do the things that intimidate you. And it's not about getting over that fear. It's about who you become going through it. The, the second thing is, is go do things that are bigger than you. Go do what I call go big and loud. So in this day and age, if you're not on social media going live, if you're not putting out content, if you're not getting on podcasts, if you're not getting on stages, if you're not becoming a brand, then you're missing out on a huge growth opportunity for you personally and professionally. You know, there's entire businesses wrapped around people just sharing their story. And it's not about the Instagram mansions and limos and, and fake stuff. It's about you sharing your real authentic message so your people raise their hand and want to come hang out. It's part of building off of that vision. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is everything comes down to systems and processes. Quit trying to be everything in your business and hire out the stuff that you don't like doing. I've got 10 people under the Success Champions brand helping me out from automations to social media to, to writing, editing, copywriting, you, know, you name it. They're there. And it's all because it's, those things are not my strengths. Focus on your strengths, outsource the rest, and, and go big. I promise, if you start doing the first one, going and breaking things, going to the end of the day and literally looking back and go, what did I break? What did I learn from it? And how can I teach that to somebody else? It'll be an absolute game changer in your business. Mm. Well, thank you for all of those, Donna. We covered a lot of things all the way, you know, from being the house that everybody was hanging out, drinking and smoking. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah, well, you had, you had a family support system and a place to encourage. And in spite of maybe not having the penny fall in the slot, a little bit later, so what? 90 to 95% of people never do find sort of that purpose or vision statement or dream that's kind of connected to them. So thanks for doing that. Mm, uh, if you. people want to find out more, again, your site is Donnie Bovine, but if we say B O I B I N dot com with B O N N I E before that. And Donnie, thanks very much for hanging out with us. Stay on the line, but thanks for hanging out and, and being here with us today. Yeah, absolutely. One last thing for you, Ken. Guys, do me a favor. If you're listening to the show and you got any value out of it whatsoever, do Ken the biggest favor and go leave him a review wherever you're listening to. So it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you're listening to it, leave him a review and you can do him one better. If you will literally teach somebody else how to subscribe to his show, it would mean the absolute world for him. As a fellow podcaster, I can tell you that people subscribing, sending a quick message are our lifeline and we love it. So leave him a review, teach somebody else how to subscribe and show him a little bit of love. It'll mean everything to him. Well, Donnie, that's actually how I end every show. So thank you for that, <laughs> that mention. <laughs> And it's interesting, you know, as fellow podcasters, a lot of times we actually don't even know 
but I got a LinkedIn message from somebody the other day who ha- isn't actually subscribed, but he said, you know, I listened to all your podcasts and they're amazing. And so we don't know what we don't know. Those comments are appreciated, you know, yes, and do a review as you've mentioned and for Donnie's show when we, uh, for your podcast on success champions as well is for them to go and listen to yours is that it, it is a way to know that we are making a difference out there. So thank you Absolutely. very much. I thank everybody for listening to Secrets of Success and giving us your most valuable commodity, your time. You've been listening to Secrets of Success with Dr. Ken Keyes. Thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.